So good afternoon and, and welcome. It's good to see such a, a, a good turnout on a cold, snow-delayed day. So I thank you very much for braving the weather and, and coming out and joining us today for what I think, what I hope, what I know would be a really good discussion. So I'm Roger Mark D'Souza, and I direct our environmental change and security program here at uh, the Woodrow Wilson Center. And I wanted to welcome you to the center. I don't know if most recently you've seen some of the new rankings from the University of Pennsylvania survey looking at think tanks. But the Wilson Center is now ranked the number five U.S. think tank. It remains in the top ten worldwide, and it is the top U.S. think tank to watch. And in looking at those rankings, the, the one ranking that I am um, perhaps most excited about is we were ranked as the number two best transdisciplinary research program at a think tank. And I just want to share with you some titles. Water and Conflict, a toolkit for programming, looking at some of the key issues and implications for programs. Harvesting Peace, Food Security, Conflict and Cooperation, another research project we've worked on. Backdraft, the conflict potential of climate change, adaptation, and mitigation. You have copies of, of these uh, research reports outside. So this is the kind of transdisciplinary research that we have been able to do here at the Wilson Center with our support from our friends and colleagues at USAID in the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation. And it is today that we take advantage of that collaboration to tell you a little bit about our plans uh, for the upcoming year. And to kick us off is um, a friend and partner, colleague, um, Melissa Brown, who is the director of uh, the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation in USAID's Bureau for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance, DACHO. And Melissa has 20 years' experience with USAID and with the State Department on a wide range of democracy governance, conflict mitigation, and fragile state initiatives. Previously, she was the deputy director of USAID's Office of Policy in the Bureau of Policy, planning and learning. And Melissa and I were just chatting before we came in here and you know, she was telling me it's so hard because we continue to try to get out in the field and know what's going on and making sure that we have a contact with our colleagues there and have a real sense of, of realities on the ground. But she also said to me, you know what, I don't have to do it all because I have such a great team. So it's, it's wonderful to be able to spread that out across across the team. So I'm going to invite Melissa to come up and tell us a little bit more about um, her team and our collaboration together. Mm -hmm. Melissa? Thank you, Roger Mark. Um, I'm thrilled to be here for more than one reason <laughs> today. Uh, as I was uh, walking out to my car, I had to dodge ice chunks that were falling from what I call Montgomery County's largest magnolia tree. <laughs> so I'm glad that the weather uh, is in our favor and that you all were all able to join us here today. This is a fantastic showing and thank you to those who are joining us online. Um, I am so pleased to be able to mark the launch uh, with this event of the Resilience for Peace Project, known as, uh, of course, uh, an acronym, uh, RFPP2. Uh, this new project is a strategic partnership between USAID's Office of Conflict Management Mitigation and the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program. RFPP2 seeks to identify, assess, and disseminate practical and innovative research, best practices, and lessons learned at the nexus of environment, climate change, conflict, and peace building. At the heart of RFPP2 is the promotion of innovation and cross-fertilization across different communities of practice, recognizing that development challenges are often interconnected and the solutions we uh, advance are still often uh, too siloed. And I think this goes to the transdisciplinary nature of what Roger Mark was talking about and how important it is to address uh, this nexus of issues. 
Today's conversation tackles one important aspect of this new project and gives priority attention to how resilience relates explicitly to natural resource management and climate change, as well as conflict and fragility. It is my great pleasure to announce really a stellar panel today. Uh, Sunday Bridget Jones is on that panel. She is the Associate Director of International Development with the Rockefeller Foundation. Roger Mark D'Souza, Director of Population, Environmental Security and Resilience, of course, with the Wilson Center. John Kurtz, Director of Research and Learning with Mercy Corps. And of course, St Tom Stahl, the Acting Administ Assistant Administrator with USAID's Bureau for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance. I also want to, of course, acknowledge Cynthia Brady, who is with the Office of Conflict Management and Mitigation, for her uh, long-standing leadership on these issues, and she will be moderating the panel today. I want to thank the panel, of course, for your time and the expertise that you're going to lend to this important uh, topic. Also, since today is the formal launch of RFPP2, I want to thank, again, the Wilson Center, Roger Mark, and his stellar team for their partnership over, uh, over the years. We have worked together closely uh, to foster learning and push new thinking, again, around this nexus of environment, climate change, conflict, and peace building. The community of practice is stronger and we really have a track record together of innovation and uh, certainly uh, we are confident that will continue. Just a few remarks before I turn it to the panel. We are here today because RFPP2 is poised to help us innovate, to help us learn, and to improve our approaches to complex development challenges. Most of these challenges are, again, interconnected and influenced some way, large or small, by natural resource management and often a context of con conflict and fragility. To illustrate, there is growing evidence that suggests the majority of the world's fragile and conflict-affected countries will also be highly exposed to the impacts of climate change, particularly in parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, South and Southeast Asia. Recommend Recognizing the common threads uh, between these challenges helps us to avoid missteps and leverage our investments for maximum impact, including building resilience. For USAID, issues of resilience and conflict are often intertwined, and we are working to better understand their relationship uh, to each other in the context of our work. Uh, you will find on the table CMM's uh, newest technical publication, on building resilience in fragile or conflict-affected environments. And I just want to pull three points from that paper that I think are important for the discussion today. One, conflict is a different kind of shock. It is not the same as externally imposed stresses, such as extreme weather events. People cannot be resilient to the consequences of violent conflict in the same way that we would seek to bolster resilience to the effects of a natural disaster. Also, conflict erodes resilience. The destructive impact of civil war erodes resilience in people and in communities, leaving them more vulnerable to the stresses of any future shock. And lastly, conflict sensitivity is necessary in resilience building activities. Resilience focused approaches should exist, should draw upon existing resources in conflict management and peace building practice to ensure that we do no harm. During uh, today's discussion, I hope that the interconnected nature of the development challenges we face comes to light. I hope that we can collectively begin to explore uh, what we can learn from one another and how we can apply existing tools in innovative new ways. I also hope that we can identify opportunities uh, for development work to support peace, improve resource management, and strengthen resilience. Most of all, I look forward to the panel uh, here today and their reflections and to the discussion that will follow. So I'd like to go ahead and invite our esteemed uh, panel to join uh, me here, and uh, I will join the rest of you in the audience. Thank you.
find a pen when you need one. <laughs> <laughs> So good afternoon, everyone. We're so happy that all of you could be here with us today to launch our new partnership between CMM and the Wilson Center, but really to continue our long tradition of collaboration around the nexus of environmental issues, climate change, and conflict. We are so fortunate to have our panelists here with us today to have our first conversation within this partnership, which <coughs> is focused on dimensions of resilience. And all of the People sitting to my left have really incredible experience working across all different development communities of practice, from food security to population and health, democracy and governance, and peace building. And all of them have really worked to try to foster strategic thinking as well as integrated policies and programming. Their individual work on a cross-cutting issue like resilience, I think, really drives home their focus on integration. They have each helped us to move forward our collective understanding of and appreciation for the concept of resilience as it relates to peace building. And today, in line with the specific focus of the new RFPP2 project, we have the opportunity to hear about both their organizational focus on resilience as well as their individual experiences in the field. And as you'll hear today, all of them have really come into contact directly with the way that natural resource management, climate change, conflict, and peace building are interrelated in the real world. So we hope to benefit from both kind of that higher order organizational understanding of these issues and their individual experiences. Uh, I'll just say a few additional words to introduce each of them so you know why we chose to put this panel together. Together they really offer a very comprehensive understanding of and picture of the connections of these issues from the policy level to the analytical level to the implementation level and then all the way on to learning. So I hope that we'll have a chance to touch on all of those issues today. We know a lot of you in the audience also have experience around these different dimensions of resilience. So we hope that we'll all have an opportunity to engage and interact with the panel after we've had a chance to have some remarks and discussion among ourselves up on the panel. First to my left, Sunday Bridget Jones. Um, as Melissa mentioned, she is an Associate Director of International Development at the Rockefeller Foundation. She has a very strong background in leading democracy and governance initiatives with a special focus on sectoral trends such as urbanization and gender. <laughs> Prior to joining the Rockefeller, Rockefeller Foundation, she was the Acting Director for Policy Planning and Public Diplomacy at the U.S. Department of State. And before that, she was, with, she was an International Affairs Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. We're proud to say she began her career with USAID working on democracy and governance issues. Roger Mark D'Souza, you all know extremely well, but I would like to highlight his long experience working to integrate programs that are related to population, environment, and health issues. He, of course, leads the ECF ECSP program here at the Wilson Center. And before joining the center, he was the vice president of research and the director of climate programs at Population Action International. And before that, he was with the Sierra Club and the Population Reference Bureau. John Kurtz uh, is with Mercy Corps as the director for research and learning, where he leads the Mercy Corps program research and impact evaluation efforts. I've had the pleasure of working with John for a number of years now, and I can say he really is an innovator in the field of evaluation. He has many years of experience working in developing countries, and in particular in fragile and conflict-affected contexts. So we look forward to tapping into that experience today. And finally, let me say a few words about my boss, Tom Stahl, um, who has worked for USAID since 1988. He has served in many posts around the world, from Sudan to Kenya to West Bank, Gaza, and Iraq. He's worked on many, many issues, including food aid, humanitarian assistance, emergency response. More recently, he served as mission director in Lebanon, Ethiopia, and Iraq. And he's currently the acting assistant administrator for the Bureau for Democracy, Conflict, and Humanitarian Assistance. So hopefully you will agree with me that this is a great collection of people to talk about issues of resilience from lots of different perspectives. And I am going to organize today's conversation by asking each of the panelists a leading question. But we really hope that all of the panelists will feel free to chime in on the questions that were asked to others and sort of cultivate an interactive conversation. I'll start with Tom by asking what led you and you <coughs> to adopt the resilience approach. And could you say a few words about what you're doing differently now that that resilience frame has been adopted and specifically what we're learning as it relates to working in fragile environments? Thanks a lot, Cynthia. That's a pretty big question. Uh, <laughs> we could spend a lot of time talking about some of those things. But first, I want to thank Melissa and uh, Roger Mark for initiating this project for the team that you all put together. And it's great for me to 
to be a part of it, uh, to provide some, you know, at the leadership level, but you guys are doing the real work, and, and I'm just glad to be a part of that. So thank you very much. Now, you know, it relates to your question, what led us to, you know, adopt this resilience approach? I think some of us who, uh, like me, were involved in the big uh, famine back in the mid-'80s, uh, you know, with Bob Geldof and We Are the World mm -hmm. back in the Horn of Africa and uh, got involved in that. And then looking at the aftermath said, you know, we really need to find a way to bring together relief and humanitarian assistance with development projects in a, in a more structured way. Some of you might remember in the mid-'90s, we had the Greater Horn of Africa Initiative. I was a part of that. It was the first initial foray, if you will, into that. But we, I don't know if the time wasn't right or we weren't ready or it didn't really get anywhere. Then in 2011, there was another major drought in uh, the Horn of Africa. I happened to be the USA director in Ethiopia at the time. And in many ways, it was as big as the one back in the 80s. Okay, and the results in Somalia were very bad. You did have a famine with thousands and thousands of people dying of starvation, but we didn't in Ethiopia and Kenya. And so that was kind of the, 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 the wake up for us. Okay, what's happening here? How do we do a better job of bringing together humanitarian assistance and development? And maybe we have learned some lessons. What did we do right in Ethiopia and Kenya that we didn't? there. And then, of course, conflict was a huge part of that, obviously, in Somalia. And that was, in, in a way, the critical factor that kept us from being able to save people there. But in Ethiopia and Kenya, a big part of it started from a much better job of, first of all, predicting when things were going to happen by putting in the fuse net s system where we could track uh, rainfall patterns and um, growth of cereals, movement of people, and so on. Then also, obviously, we had networks on the ground and programs going on, and we had put in some flexibility into some of our programs already. So, for instance, in Ethiopia, we had something called the crisis modifier, mm -hmm. which allowed us to put OFDA, if you will, or, or humanitarian assistance funding into a development program that was already in place. So rather than bringing in a new partner to deal with the, uh, the, the, the crisis, you could work with your existing partner and give them more funding and more flexibility to deal with the, uh, the issue. And, and so that got us thinking. And so from that, we started a more uh, resilience-focused uh, approach. Um, we launched the following year a policy and program guidance. Then we, within USAID, we've done a lot of sort of institutionalizing, trying to figure out, okay, how do we do a better job of bringing together the humanitarian assistance side and the development side? And also, even in our sort of planning and and programming um, approaches. So we have set up a resilience leadership team of senior people across the agency that meet on a regular basis. We set up a secretariat, which is now going to become the Resilience Center to kind of provide some ongoing lessons learned and uh, a way of sharing information and providing support to the missions. We set up a joint coordination council or team within the Sahel and in the Horn. We call it the JCC to bring together different countries who are working on these things. And then, of course, with Rockefeller, we've set up the Global Resilience Partnership, which provides a partnership with some organizations that we don't always work with and some also some innovation, realizing that we don't have all the answers. And the way we've always done things hasn't necessarily been the best way, and we're going to get some new ideas. Um, so that's sort of the institutional side, but what does it actually mean on the ground? So let me throw out a couple examples, 
And then, you know, we can talk more as, as we go on today. So, for instance, in Ethiopia, if you look into southern Ethiopia, those of you who know the area, it's, it's a pastoralist area, semi-desert, and you've got small, uh, you know, and, and large groups of, of pastoralists. But they're very vulnerable to a variety of problems, which means fragility, okay? They're vulnerable to climate shocks, to climate change. They're vulnerable to conflict over resources, but even things like conflict over water sources. And then that gets exacerbated when there is a drought. Okay, so people start moving, they bring their cattle, that causes conflict with the next group. You're fighting over water sources and so on. So you need an approach that looks at everything from climate change natural resource management, conflict issues, the sort of social dynamics of the country, as well as your long-term development approach to that group of people and the, the resources they have. And that put together to me is building resilience, okay? So one of the things we found was that a lot of the wells in their areas were not well maintained. And many of them were in bad shape. Uh, some of them were not even producing water or very small amounts of water. Okay. Then when there is a drought approaching, they're of course the first wells to fail. And that it causes people to start moving to look for water somewhere else. That means they get into conflict with the next group over that water because they say, no, that's our water source. So what we normally had to do then is use humanitarian assistance money to truck water for the people f from the area where the well was no longer working. Well, that was hugely expensive, as you can imagine, and trying to get, the, well, you know, and even getting to some of these places. Whereas we found if we actually just repaired the wells before the drought began, they didn't fail. And you do it much cheaper, you, re you reduce conflict, as well as also dealing with the, the issue of natural resource management and, uh, and, and the uh, aspects there. But also, from a more longer-term development process, as we're building the capacity of the pastoralists to raise cattle in a, in a more sustainable way and provide a, a better uh, return on their investment, what happens when you have a drought? Obviously, the cattle get hungry, they lack water, and they start to fail. So they start moving their cattle around. And the normal pastoralist, he's going to hold on to as many cattle as he can to keep them from dying. But let's say you've got a herd of 100, it's going to be a problem to keep all 100 going. What normally tends to happen is they keep trying to find water, they move, they find and eventually they start dying off. But we found if you think of it in a more developmental approach, again from a, a more um, kind of a resilience approach, if they would sell off 50%, 25, 40, 50% of their cattle early on when they know there's a drought coming, so it goes back to you gotta be able to forecast. So you sell off some of your cattle while they're still in good condition Okay, you get a higher rate of return on that cattle, and the other 50 that you have left now, you can actually maintain them because you have a much smaller number. So even though you're selling off more cattle to begin with, you actually end up with more cattle and a better herd at the end than trying to keep all 100 and all of them go down. And then when you really need to, when they're down and you know, almost about ready to die, you can't sell them because they're not worth anything anymore. So again, it's, an, it's a, a longer term development approach, but it has to be factored into this uh, part of the planning process and so on. So that's just an example where, you know, the all you have to have this multidisciplinary approach that you talked about, looking at natural resource management, conflict, the social aspects, as well as long term development. Anyway, I can give you some more examples as we go along, but just uh, started out with that.
Thank you so much, Tom. I think you've done a great job at highlighting the complexity of yeah. the challenges that we're all trying to face. And yeah, you need to understand all the economic, political, and social dynamics in order to do a good job. Absolutely, and there is never a singular sectoral response. I would invite any of the other panelists to comment, in this, comment on this. I note that the person sitting just next to you, John, has done a lot of work in southern Ethiopia working mm -hmm. with similar populations. Hard to match that <laughs> level of description of, <laughs> of southern Ethiopia. Um, but, but it resonates with a few things that we found in our work mm -hmm. there. Um, on, the, on the structural side, I, I was wanting to mention, um, you preempted me, USAID's ability to, to really mobilize resources quickly in these situations as being critical. Mm -hmm. So in, in fact, on Mercy Corps' side, having been um, uh, able to use one of these crisis modifiers in Ethiopia in the 2011 drought to be able to respond in, in areas that were experiencing a crisis while at the same time uh, maintaining development programs elsewhere was, was, was critical to be a, being able to work on those, on those two tracks. So that's the example I'll give for now. I'll, I'll come back to Ethiopia in terms of some of the conflict resilience dynamics a bit later. Okay, great. Uh, if I could pick up on something else that Tom, sent, Tom said about um, the fact that the pastoralists in Ethiopia are vulnerable to a lot of different types of stresses and those things are exacerbated by circumstances like drought. I wonder if I could invite Roger Mark to talk a little bit about how some of these different global trends, including climate <coughs> change, but also things like urbanization and coastal development are interacting um, with resilience. And how does the work that the Wilson Center is doing on resilience take into account some of those intersections and trends? <coughs> and parse out a little bit some of those different trends. Th thank you very much, Cynthia. I, th I think for us, our starting point at the Wilson Center in thinking about this work is to figure out this resilience piece. You know, it's the new sexy buzzword. Everyone's using it. What does it mean, really? We know that it means certain things for different uh, communities of practice. From an ecological perspective, a lot of the, the ecologists we work with talk about looking at the fortitude of natural systems to rebound. From a societal resilience perspective, there are lots of, of discussions around how societies um, can bounce back and rebuild. I, I think in security terms, we talk about ways to manage and plan for political and economic disruptions and outbreaks of conflict. In taking a look at it from a peace-building perspective, and I think you'll see some of this reflected in the comments that we heard from Melissa and from USAID's new brief on resilience in a peace-building um, context, there is a, a very specific focus on thinking about resilience deficits and what does that mean and how is that exacerbated by global phenomena like climate change and ultimately what that means and recognizing that societal resilience in that con in that context so sort of a conflict resilience is important f focusing on fragility dynamics and looking at peace building components so that's sort of our point of departure and we try to figure out well what do you do with this how do you massage this how do you operationalize this how do you make this real and practical and what does it mean <clears throat> for a donor like USAID. So we, we approach that perspective and at the same time build on our skills of transdisciplinary research and analysis here at the Wilson Center. So even though this project is housed at our environmental change and security program, it's affiliated with other programs under our global sustainability and resilience programming. And some of the other programs that it's affiliated with is our programs that are specifically looking at population dynamics. So if you're talking about a changing world due to climate, what does it mean to have youth bulges? What is the impact of that? And how does this play out operationally? What does it mean? If you look in the context of, we work very closely with our urban sustainability lab here at the Wilson Center. What does it mean for urbanization and urban conflict? And how is that exacerbated by climate change impacts in an urban setting? What does that mean? What does it mean in terms of gender and um, violation of, of women's rights? How is that exacerbated 
in the context of looking at conflict and climate and what are some of the very programmatic and practical questions that we can address. So this is where we're coming to with this project. I think there, there are a few questions that we are specifically trying to answer. One of them is how does climate change and efforts to address it affect stability. So we talk about mitigation, we talk about adaptation, how do these programs have an impact on stability and how do this how does this all come together? Um, what does it mean for climate change mitigation and adaptation programming? And if we're looking at USAID in the development community, but also in the humanitarian assistance community, and also from a security military perspective, what are conflict sensitive climate change responses across the programs and policies that we can build on to support this? So that, that those are some of the key questions that we have sort of coming into this project. And we are trying very uh, deliberately to build the evidence with folks, you know, like John and the excellent work that Missy Core is doing, to build a partnership with, with folks like Rockefeller and USAID to expand the network, to make sure that the community of practice is learning from each other, but that we are building networks to new communities. And how do we capture a story? What's the story that we want to tell around this that brings new people in so that they're able to engage in a meaningful way? So those are some of the things we're focusing on. Thank you. Um, picking up one of the first things that you said, resilience is sort of the hot term. And already just in the first couple of remarks, we see that resilience can mean a lot of different things to different communities of practice. And um, when we talk about the developing world, the idea of resilience and the ability to either withstand or recover from shocks often has to do with the way people are able to manage their natural assets. And at least for USAID, the majority of the places where we're working in the developing world are actually fragile or conflict affected as well. That is not always true in the case of the Rockefeller Foundation, for example, although in their partnership with USAID and the Global Resilience Partnership, that is true to some great extent. But um, I think as we try to figure out what resilience means, in particular as it relates to issues of natural resource management and fragility, it's helpful to talk about as we begin to develop these initiatives and program in the real world, what, what dimensions of resilience are really standing out to us. And I'd like to turn to Sunday on this one, um, particularly grounding my question in two of the initiatives that the Rockefeller Foundation is implementing. The first is the 100 Resilient Cities Initiative, which speaks to these questions of urbanization as a global trend that Roger Mark referenced, um, as well as the Global Resilience Partnership with USAID and the recent announcement of 17 new challenge partners. And Tom and I talked about this this morning. It's notable that a great percentage of those projects are actually related to natural resource management and climate change. So we already see the dimensions of this kind of showing themselves. But I would like to ask Sunday if you could share with us your experience working on some of these initiatives mm -hmm. around resilience and sort of what dimensions of resilience seem to be showing themselves. Well, thanks a lot, Cynthia, and thank, um, thank you, Roger Mark, for inviting me to come to the Wilson Center. Uh, I was just outside talking to John and he asked me, he says, well, I didn't really know that the Rockefeller Foundation was working on conflict issues. And I said, yeah, I asked Cynthia, I, or Lauren, I said, Did you, are you sure you want us to come and speak to these questions? But I do think that there is a lot of learning um, to be had with respect to our broader global discourse around resilience over the past few years. And, and there are some people who um, are still in the questions around what it means for them. But I think for many of us, we're a bit beyond that. I think we've answered for ourselves and together um, why we are focusing on resilience as a broader community. Uh, we have the triple threat, as many have mentioned already, of globalization uh, with the population growth that we know will be uh, uh, doubled in, uh, by 2050, and we have talked about urbanization um, as well and, 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 and then the impact of climate change. And so that answers for many of us, um, in addition to those, those three, uh, I guess, phenomena, 
uh, a question around complexity and uncertainty that we all face moving forward. And that's why, that's why we're all focused on these, on these questions. Um, and here at the foundation, we um, have a good deal of learning over the past decade around this. We started focusing on climate change resilience, particularly in Asia cities, um, with our Asian Cities Climate Change Network, where we were looking at questions uh, of flooding, um, uh, and how city administrators in particular, not only how they uh, address some of their key hazards, but um, the way in which they, they address them, the processes, the planning, the integration of community perspectives, um, trying to really gather learning from elsewhere in neighboring cities about how to address some of these things. Uh, and so our learning started with climate change resilience, although we certainly have a president in Dr. Rodin who's had a long history in psychology um, uh, as her background, and so she brought some of this, I think, to our, our broader foundation learning around resilience. But our learning on climate change pivoted to be thinking more broadly about all the other dimensions out there and how can we be agnostic about the hazards. Um, and thinking about resilience and, and what are some of the key aspects that we all need to consider as we do so. And I just want to posit a few that I think for us has been uh, really important. Um, I think, it, you know, there are so many aspects of resilience that make it quite challenging. We're all working across different scales. We um, have uh, different sectors that we need to factor in. Uh, there are so many different communities that uh, we, we, we should consider, um, and it, it adds to the complexity of it. But as we start to really break things down, and um, I really, first I wanna commend uh, USAID and the Wilson Center for coming together as a partnership and exploring some of these dimensions, because in our own partnership with USAID, with the Global Resilience uh, Partnership, we, we have been, over the past year, iterating on what is a, a, a joint emerging perspective on um, how to be supportive of resilience building in the Sahel, the Horn, and South and Southeast Asia. Um, and I just want to just offer three things. One, um, you, we've been talking a good deal about innovation and what does that actually mean with respect to resilience and how critical is that for resilience. And, and we started actually the, the partnership with USAID or thinking about it um, for a number of reasons. We've heard from the communities that we needed to find ways to bridge humanitarian and development assistance and, and how resilience, the lens of resilience, using that systems thinking approach, thinking about how we can prepare ourselves, not just um, for you know, the immediate needs uh, after the shock, but also much more long-term and how do we begin to think of, um, of, of uh, effective uses of, of both humanitarian and development assistance. And what innovation might be able to, what the concept of innovation might be able to bring to that, how we can um, uh, take the recombination of things that we know work well, put it together and perhaps use it in a different way, um, a new way to be able to, to focus on these things. And that's what really the Global Resilience Partnership is about. It's how can we surface those new innovations that are out there that we know communities are have been using, whether it's uh, you know, tra money transfer, whether, uh, uh, whether we're talking about um, how to build new roads with a new focus on hydrology, you have, in, you know, these, these permeable surfaces that allow water to seep through, those kinds of things, how we can think about um, trading livestock and how that can be different and, and begin to lower the risks for some pastoralist communities in the Horn of African places that Tom spoke of. Um, and, and, and the extent to which we might be able to put a little bit of risk capital out there for people to think more carefully about those innovations and really, really, um, really uh, uh, focus on that. Or even how we think differently about information. We have supported a, re um, a research effort by Internews, their Center for Innovation, thinking about information ecosystems and how they work, not only in crisis times, but also in, in other times where we're, 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 because that's such a huge part of how people um, really come together and think about building the kinds of adaptive capacities they need to, uh, to uh, in the face of shocks and stresses. So innovation, I think, is one. Uh, the second area I would just say is just our learning around the whole notion of applying um, the concept of, res of resilience, which has its home in ecology and psychology, as Roger Mark mentioned, but we've been using in the context of, of, of these social contexts and, and, and even for many of you are working much more 
and in conflict settings. But and when I mean learning or, or what are our gaps around that, I think the gender resilience question is a huge one, just in terms of understanding differentiated impacts for men and women and boys and girls in the context of some of the, the stresses and shocks. But also, how do we do social capital differently to be supportive of what we know our, our threads are really the fabric of many societies and to help them to deal with uh, some of the shocks that they face and some of the stresses that they face. Or even how do we think about leadership, for instance, um, and using that, you know, what kinds of new learning can we do to really add to our understanding of how resilience um, plays out um, in different contexts? And maybe the last one I'll just say, and I'd love to have a conversation about this as well, is we've been talking a lot as a community about alliances, what new alliances are out there. And we've had a big mantra around bringing private sector in with the hope that they might we might be able to leverage some of their resources for the funding that's been um, so uh, put out, you know, the significant amount of money, particularly um, in the same places year after year uh, uh, of resources from the public domain. Um, and, and, and I think many of the, the, the facets that we've been talking about with respect to the Global Resilience Partnership is indeed trying to get more private sector involved, whether it's looking at um, insurance or um, thinking about new ways of thinking about research. We've been talking to IBM about their Watson system and what, 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 what that might be able to offer all of us. I mean, I'm sure many of you have been as well. Um, but it's really the, the points that I think uh, Roger Mark made earlier about the multidisciplinary nature of people coming together in teams in different ways to think through some of the challenges. So you have the ecologists and the sociologists and the political scientists and whomever else together, we can be thinking about these together. And I, 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 you know, I think about some of the relationships between what I learned and did when I was at USAID and what I'm doing now. And these are, in a way, textbook examples of what development should be, um, but unfortunately aren't because of the lack of incentives or other incentives for wrong reasons for mm -hmm. siloed approaches and less integrated approaches. So, I mean, I think there's much more to say, but innovation, learning, and new ways of, of partnering and, 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 and uh, coming together with people are, I think, some critical dimensions of what a resilience lens might be able to bring, whether we're learning from it from the context of ecology or psychology or, or other areas. Thank you, Sunday. That's fantastic. And it reminds me, uh, one of my favorite phrases of Roger Marx is he says, we are silo busters here at the Wilson Center. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you want to say anything also about this point of alliances and the work that's being done in the Resilience Academy or other comments? No, I, I, I think it's very important. Um, so to, to build on what, what you're saying, really being able to think about how we are uh, able to operationally move across different sectors in a meaningful way so that there are, there are opportunities to think about what we can do in the short term, the mid term, and, and the long term. So part of the work that we are, are doing currently, we are part of a global initiative called the Resilience Academy that's supported by um, the UN University and the Munich Re Reinsurance Industry. And it's a very interesting uh, model Model. We are 30 global experts um, that are looking specifically at resilience in the context of climate change. And there's a subset of us within that academy that is looking at violence and conflict and what it means in terms of building resilience in a climate uh, change world. And many of my colleagues there are actually from Latin America. So it's very interesting because operationally, we, we tend to focus a lot on Africa and, and Sub-Saharan Africa and, and Southeast Asia. I don't see as many examples of, of projects I personally don't see from Latin America. So it's good to have, have that experience. Um, the, the next round of the academy is going to focus on loss and damage. 
So it's very interesting to see how those questions and, and the debate on loss and damage now, how that relates to conflict and peace building. So we, we, we're having discussions about what that means now and, and sort of formulating the, the agenda for that. Part of this project um, that we have, the Resilience to Peace project, is also looking at what this means in terms of policy. So we are collaborating with a number of partners under um, the G with the G7, and we are looking at how can the G7 think about these questions of conflict, fragility, um, and climate change, and what could the G7 be doing? So that's another example of our being able to work across um, governmental silos um, with a policy-making body that's, that's very prominent and setting the agenda um, globally within that context. Uh, picking up on another point Sunday raised with respect to innovation, I was thinking of John's work in two ways. One, you noted that you sort of started out thinking about resilience as it relates to climate change and evolved to other issues outside of that. Mercy Corps' work didn't start with that, started with peace building and came around to understanding the co-benefits for building resilience to climate change. So I wonder if you want to also say something about Mercy Corps' work and how you think about the dimensions of resilience. Um, and also you mentioned thinking about innovation in terms of uh, the type of work that you're doing. And I wonder if you also wanted to comment on how Mercy Corps' work has evolved in terms of the types of programming that you're supporting in that context. We like to say that innovation is part of our DNA in Mercy Corps. Um, and, and I think resilience is one where it's more needed than anywhere else, um, mainly because this is just a lot we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so trying out a bunch of different ideas, um, giving some good attention to seeing what works and, and moving forward with them is, is broadly the, the approach that we're taking. Um, I, I see sort of two ways that we come about that. One, uh, one is something traditionally that we're doing happens to um, have a, a knock-on benefit of supporting social resilience. Um, and, I'll, and I'll explain a little bit about some of our work in the Horn of Africa around conflict management um, and how that happened. But in terms of pure innovations aimed at strengthening resilience, um, I think here's where it's, it's, it's been really nice to have the space um, from support from USA and Rockefellers and others to be able to try out things around. Um, so for example, one of our big assumptions around building resilience is, is uh, strengthening financial inclusion. So trying to do, for example, in the Philippines, um, economic recovery work in, uh, in response to the typhoon last year uh, in a way that would um, leave people connected with formal financial institutions. So in this case, you know, e-transfers that would then come with bank mm -hmm. accounts. Um, you know, that, that innovation came with a lot of learning. Um, it, it was one where we came out the other end with some decent evidence that, yeah, that's probably the right way to go. Um, maybe some different types of financial institutions would be the, the best place to be able to reach the populations that are most affected. But generally, this idea of being able to, um, to come out with an assumption, um, run it through a program and come out the other end with something to say about typically <coughs> this part of it looks good, this part of it we, we want to ditch is, um, is certainly needed in resilience. I just wanted to say, if I might, Cynthia, a couple of things because uh, it just it brings to, to mind a few things that we're also doing. And I, what I find really interesting is that we're all on this journey of learning around resilience. And we, can, we are exploring together these various aspects. And you talked about the co-benefits of resilience. And uh, many of you may uh, have heard about, and I hope that you have a chance to read it, uh, Dr. Roden's book called The Resilience Dividend. Um, and the premise of that book is that there are indeed some co-benefits mm -hmm. of investing early on in resilience efforts. Um, and what exactly does that mean? Because I think it relates to a conversation that we all struggle with, which is how do we measure? How do we know a community is resilient? How do we know systems are resilient? Those kinds of things. But essentially, it's a question around asset value plus mm -hmm. you know, avoidance of loss, basically. Uh, some people like to call it return on investment. But I think it might be slightly different from that. But you know, the question is, well, uh, what is the co-benefit of this particular investment in, in, this, in this infrastructure? Or what, c what can I um, gain from in terms of understanding what is this community actually gaining as a result of you know, uh, working in this way or um, uh, other kinds of resilience investments? And, and the whole notion of measuring resilience, I think it's such a huge challenge. Um, 
And we have, we started off thinking about it from a very broad perspective. How do we think about measuring resilience? And what we had to do was break it down and start looking at different scales and trying to understand the, the question that we all talk about is resilience to what kind of thing. Um, and if my friend who, if you have the, I don't know if the, it's okay now if we can just put up a couple of slides, I wanted to just show um, how we've been looking at this, particularly from an urban context, because as many of you, you know, and as Cynthia has described, we've taken this um, uh, adventure and, and we've started a 100 resilient cities effort um, and very much looking uh, in a way about how we can be supportive of various people and institutions and processes in cities to be able to build resilience for the most, uh, poor, uh, most vulnerable people in cities. Uh, but how do we begin to understand what that looks like in cities? Uh, and then using that understanding, how do we uh, measure, how do we measure the, the, the performance of cities in terms of, of resilience building. And we've been working with Arab International Development over the past year on the development of something called the City Resilience Framework. Um, and we'd like to turn it into an index and we're starting to do that work now. But essentially, this is an annulus that basically shows four dimensions of, we, of what we feel are quite critical in terms of building resilience in cities. Uh, one is we've been talking about health and well-being. I think Tom mentioned this earlier when he was trying to bring together the different areas in which we all have to pay attention. Uh, so health and well-being, basically, focusing on the people and what it is that, that they need, their, their minimum kind of uh, uh, standards, minimum human vulnerability, what does that look like, what kinds of livelihoods and employment are available for them, their safeguards in terms of the health care that they have, you know, those kinds of things. So that's one quadrant, health and well-being. A second is focusing on economy and society and looking at how um, uh, rule of how uh, uh, rule of law measures link in with uh, social networks, uh, basically how people organize themselves socially and, and, and in financial systems in cities. Um, a third area uh, is really about place. Uh, it's around infrastructure and environment, and that, that's where we get to a lot of the physical sciences and a lot of focus on natural resource management and uh, some of the ecological aspects that, that we all um, feel are very important for any community. Uh, and then lastly, you know, really thinking about leadership and, and strategy and what mechanisms are in place for us to <coughs> really build knowledge. And what's interesting about this framework is, is it was built on work that Arab did with the International Federation for the Red Cross, where they went into communities um, in Asia post-tsunami um, and tried to understand what makes for a safe and resilient community in that context. Um, and knowledge was a huge area in terms of people's you know, understanding and their ability to be able to adapt, um, to, to uh, adapt their own capacities to be able to deal with uh, the unknown or even you know things that 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 are that they know that are coming, um, but essentially this is we're we're this is obviously work that's being done for an urban context. Um, I've been talking just about its applicability, for instance, in uh, Horn of Africa in the Sahel. But in my view, also I think there are many dimensions that would be applicable, um, or at least from a from a conceptual perspective. Uh, from more of an index perspective, we have to, that's another, that's of course another story. Um, and there are many other dimensions in the rural context that we have to consider. But I do think there is a path to be thinking about these questions from a much more holistic perspective for us not to be stuck in the place based corner all the time talking about infrastructure and those kinds of things, although we know that that's very important, but to understand the interdependencies, if you will. Uh, between between those those four areas, um, so we hope to have an index of this by the end of this calendar year, where we uh, will it will be available f um, to the public, but but mostly to to cities and city actors, administrators and NGOs and others, so that they might not only be able to understand where they are in terms of resilience, but again to be thinking a little bit more carefully about how how to how to measure that over time, um, but. Thanks for allowing me to, to share that. Great, thank you, Tom. Yeah, thanks, and uh, that's, that's great. And uh, you know, in a way, I think what she illustrates there is that resilience is not a special initiative. It's really a much more holistic way of looking at what we're trying to accomplish, okay? And it's really about building 
a set of capacities and capabilities within individuals, communities, nations, systems, it's, it's a systems approach, and building, com protecting assets and building those assets. Some of them, they are uh, ones that people already have an idea of how to do it, but don't have the capabilities, whether it's education or finances or, uh, you know, a, a conflict gets in the middle of it and they're not able to take advantage of it. But then also it's innovation, uh, bringing in new ideas. And, and a, a big part of the partnership that we're doing with the Rockefeller on the innovation side is really connecting from the local community level all the way up to international and bringing in, you know, uh, maybe a, a university or a think tank from this side with a local NGO, kind of a different sort of partnership than we would normally do to help look at those capacities and how do we build those to give people the, the, the ability to withstand the shock, to rebound from it, and to, to move ahead. Right. And, and again, it's a very holistic, multidisciplinary approach that can look at so many different aspects of building those cap capabilities. Gotcha, Mark. So if I can make a quick comment and then I have a question for you, John. Um, they, so, you know, I, I was very interested when I read Judith's book, The Resilience Dividend, and sort of looking at some of the work that we have coming out of USAID, where they talk about a resilience deficit. Mm. You know, sort of the, the counter argument. And I think when we look at resiliency and what it means in a conflict setting and in a peace building setting, it's, it's a little bit different. You know, it's read, I think as Melissa was alluding to, it's not an, an external shock. It's very much driven by internal dynamics. It's very systemic. Um, it's very much tied to political institutions and systems. So this is a, an added layer and an added dimension that I think we're talking about in the resiliency context. And I think having the conflict and peace building frame is building our understanding and discourse and further analysis on resilience that fits into your work. Mm -hmm. So I hope that um, as you hear us speak today, mm -hmm. that there's an added dimension that I think we're talking about that adds to, to a little bit of your framework too, that you won't get if you weren't looking at it from a peace building perspective. Mm -hmm. So it's not the external shocks, it's systemic, it's internal, and that's important, and that's significant, because the response mechanisms then are different. So it's, it's sort of an, an additional twist on it that I think is important. John, I was quite intrigued as you were talking and you sort of, as you, you trailed off to the end, you said we sort of have these assumptions as we go into our programming, we test them and we de determine what are some of the things we, we would ditch. I'd love to know what are some of the things you, you've said, you know, we're going to test this, um, this resiliency framework in a context um, in, in, a, in a climate change conflict context, and there are a couple things we've ditched. What have you ditched that we can all learn from? <laughs> it, let me see if I can answer and relate it back to the, the framework, because I, re I really like the thinking that's gone into this, the Resilient Cities framework and potentially an index, and there's, there are other similar frameworks and indices for um, household resilience and community resilience by other agencies. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, what they represent is a lot of our theories on you know, what is most important for re urban resilience to the type of shocks that are most common in this case, Southeast Asia. Um, but we, we, we assume those things until we ha can learn otherwise. And so one, one that's in here and on all the other frameworks that we've had um, is livelihoods diversity or employment opportunities. And it makes sense on, um, on the surface that you know, if you have a more diverse set of, of income sources, you're gonna be spreading risk across different types of shocks um, and be able to fare better. Looking at that across a number of studies, both in the Horn and then recently in the Philippines, um, we haven't found, nor have others that have looked into this, that yeah, the number of both sort of the total number or even the independence of those income sources is really a strong predictor of uh, less asset loss or greater recovery or whatever outcome we want to look at. So what, what I'm trying to do with that is to help refine these frameworks over time to say, okay, for this population, for these shocks, um, we're not going to put livelihood uh, diversity in our set of assumptions anymore. Mm. We don't think that that's a, a good bet there. Mm. Okay. 
interesting. interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, Sunday, thank you for that graphic. It was fantastic. Uh, within CMM, when we talk about resilience, we ask ourselves three questions. When you said one of them in your remarks, one is resilience to what, mm -hmm. resilience by whom, and resilience through what. Those are really important questions to ask in the design of programming, and I'm about to turn to our program designer, John, in a second here. I think getting all of those dimensions right helps us come up with a correct theory of change for a program, and then to monitor and manage that theory of change behind a program as dynamics change. And as we're moving in this direction towards working in a context of conflict or fragility, mm -hmm. that ability to be dynamic and to measure your theory of change becomes really important. So I wanted to ask John, whose organization is doing a lot of work in fragile and conflict-affected contexts, how does building resilience there look different? And how are you developing your approach to measuring that? I, I appreciate being asked to speak to the, the practitioner side, although asking me to, to talk about program design as a researcher um, may be a stretch yet, but I'll do my best. You can <laughs> represent uh, your colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think there are a couple big implications of, of working on resilience and conflict in, in fragile contexts. Um, the first is that we can no longer treat conflict as an externality, something that we can't influence or do anything about. So that's the mindset we generally approach you know, droughts with, um, economic shocks, generally there's something outside of our control. Um, whereas conflicts, with the exceptions of big intractable kind of state-sponsored Syria-type conflicts, um, by and large we can and should be trying to reduce the likelihood of, of violence as well as the consequences um, of that on, on people's lives. So bringing it more central. That's um, first, and I think, you know, goes without saying when, when you're talking about it uh, um, as CM, CMM, but I think a lot of other actors have, have put conflict in sort of a, a, a B basket in terms of the types of shocks that we're interested in, and so we still don't know nearly as much about uh, the dy dynamics around conflict and resilience as we do with, with natural disasters and, uh, and even market shocks. So the second implication for us has been really to, to design responses um, recognizing that there's not a single shock that often people are, are facing. So it, it's conflict on top of um, a food price shock um, and potentially a governance crisis. And then from there, trying to figure out, all right, you know, what, what set of factors, if we're effective in, in changing them, would both um, be leverage points for reducing conflict or the effects of conflict, as well as building uh, resilience to some of the, the livelihood or health shocks. And it's... Um, it's one of these ones where it's not, it's not automatic that you're going to find you know, interventions or policies that, that do all of that. So, so it's not just if we do good conflict management work or good economic development, um, we're going to see dividends across all types of resilience. And I think that you know, some of the economic growth stuff is, um, is telling here. So we've had programs that have been quite successful in um, increasing productivity and incomes. Um, but when we reviewed for, through a resilience lens, we realized that we're actually sort of consolidating risk around a few you know, key market-based crops, um, and that's making people more vulnerable to market shocks. So good development, but not good resilient development. You know, conflict management work, I think, could fall um, you know, prey to some of the similar, similar risks. So what we have been doing, doing is working on trying to identify these mechanisms that are sort of shared between good conflict work um, as well as good, what we're calling sort of you know, livelihoods or social resilience work. And the one that, that stands out um, across the, the majority of our projects um, has been mentioned a couple of times already, which is really social cohesion and, and um, social networks. So this is, as Sunday described, kind of the glue between people that helps them deal with, uh, with times of stressors, people they can rely on. Um, and I'll give a couple of examples of, of how this has come out in some of our, of our research and programming. So in, in southern Somalia in 2012, we went in and did some research trying to look at uh, why certain families came out of that complex crisis in 2010-11 uh, better off than others. And the thing that stood out as the, yes, as the biggest predictor of, in this case we were looking at some food security outcomes, um, so better food security was the extent to which families had been interacting and linked with other families outside of their clan. So kind of like the livelihoods example, but in this case, thinking of it in terms of a social network of, of spreading relationships out to other areas that may have been affected differently or less than um, where they were living. Then looking at a, a sort of an example of a program model that's tried to address 
social cohesion. Um, this is the Ethiopia example that, that Cynthia had mentioned, uh, which is essentially a, a USAID-funded conflict management project in the area that Tom described in southern Ethiopia, working in the time prior to the 2011 drought on essentially you know, building trust, reducing conflict between conflicting groups generally over shared natural resources. Um, and it was quite successful in, in achieving those peace building goals, um, mainly through uh, peace agreements um, and, and accords that they used to, to govern natural resource management. Um, the drought hits, and this turns out to be quite effective in allowing people to negotiate access to more distant pastures, um, areas they couldn't access before, water points um, that weren't available to them. So it really allowed them to use a, a traditional coping strategy, which is mobility, um, much more effectively um, to be able to cope with the drought. So these kinds of examples and then research, research from other, um, other agencies is really pointing to us towards you know, the fact of needing to invest more in, you know, if we're working to build resilience in fragile states, it's really looking at this, you know, how do we do that in a way that supports social cohesion, social capital that people rely on to cope with shocks and stressors. And I think out of anywhere, conflict management given that it's focused on social cohesion as outcomes for so long, I think it has a lot of lessons to learn there to draw from. And if I may, Roger Mark, I have a Latin America example for mm -hmm. you on the same, on the same uh, line of thinking, and that's in Medellin and Colombia. Yeah. And if we think about in the 80s and 90s how uh, stressed they were by the lack of social cohesion and rule by drug cartels and the level of violence that, were t uh, that took place um, in Medellin, uh, to think about that time then and where they are now. And there has been, over the past few years, um, a lot of consideration about um, the neighborhoods that were nested on the hills of Medellin and how they were so disconnected from the valley area um, and close to the waterfront and, therefore, and disconnected in a number of ways, also economically and obviously just in terms of their own livelihoods and well-being. Um, and over the years, there's been a number of efforts um, from the Medellin uh, city government there to focus on transportation and how the, they built gondolas that allowed uh, some of the residents to uh, travel from the hill area down to the valley area um, and how that, you know, opened up a, a whole new area for um, uh, uh, prospects of, of livelihoods and um, economic development. And they have also have escalators that are uh, <laughs> going up and down the hills as well. So I think, you know, Medellin is a, a 100 resilient city and we've been working very closely with their city resilience officer there on how they might be able to um, continue to plan for uh, uh, a strategy around uh, further building resilience in the, in, in, in the city and how they might be able to use a very interesting story around a lack of social cohesion and lack of trust in community, turn that around and be thinking about what not only from uh, not only the social threads but even some of the infrastructure um, aspects that are so important in, in linking people together. Please talk. Yeah, maybe. <coughs> I can mention a, an example from Lebanon uh, after the civil war there that uh, devastated Lebanon from the mid-70s into the mid-80s. One of the um, sort of impacts of that was that you had villages, you had a Christian village next to a Shia village, next to a Druze village, and during the, the, the <coughs> conflict, it got so bad that they, you know, all the relationship between those villages broke down. And so they didn't talk to each other. They wouldn't cooperate on anything. So we started a program there to do small infrastructure programs, but in a way that the, we brought villages together and they had to work together in order to approve a project. So if we were going to do fix a well in your village, you had to get the other two villages to support it and vice versa. So you sort of fo f you know, forced them to work together in a, in a conflict mitigation program that then did development work. And what we found was, first of all, then we were able to get some things done, but then pretty soon the villages started talking to each other. And so instead of just, you know, fixing a school in my village, why don't we do a joint project? Okay, that then helps all of us. Uh, we put in a water network that, you know, that uh, benefits all three villages. And that through that, you got economies of scale and you could, 
improve, you know, agricultural output. Or you build a road that passes through two of the villages that helps you get to market. And so it was a way of a conflict mitigation program, but also doing, you know, actual real development work that built resilience in those communities. John. Just a quick follow on. I uh, think Mercy Corps might have been involved in those. May well. Uh, <laughs> I think it highlights a good point because a, a lot of the social cohesion aimed interventions right now and investments come under the sort of broader umbrella of community driven development or community driven reconstruction, which is essentially what Tom's describing, but thinking really just in terms of one community and this participatory planning and budgeting that we assume will yield kind of social benefits in terms of people within that community being more connected. Um, the, you know, the evidence on that is, is, is mixed at best, so generally shows it, it doesn't build that kind of uh, that, that social cohesion. Um, and I think where we have seen it is where you're actually intentionally bridging groups that are in conflict or where there is mistrust. So I think seeing if we can steer more of those quite big CDD investments to look at areas of, of, of dispute or those sort of border areas as, as we often work on them would be uh, a, a good way to sort of go about doing some, um, some resilience building uh, through more traditional development channels. Mm -hmm. I think um, the graphic that Sunday showed us, you used the word interdependencies, and I think that graphic really shows it, that when we try to understand the goal of building resilience, you have to walk back to all those interdependencies and understand what's connected, what's required for second and third, or what is required in some kind of parallel way. And the examples that you've given from Lebanon to Medellin to southern Ethiopia really highlight, I think, the importance of having an open mind as we do development and understanding that our development entry points may not be the most directly connected to the development outcome that we're seeking. So when you are seeking climate resilient outcomes, resiliency to the impacts of drought in southern Ethiopia, investing first in improved natural resource management and social cohesion that gives you um, mm -hmm. a peaceful place to help cope. It can be more effective in Medellin, maybe thinking about infrastructure wouldn't have been the first way to try to generate social cohesion. But these are all great examples, I think, that help us kind of open our thinking to getting the analytical frame right and being a little more innovative around the type of interventions that we would support that ultimately achieve an outcome that is more resilient. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you all for your opening comments. I'm conscious of the time and the amazing crowd that we have in the room and hopefully watching as well from home today. And I want to give an opportunity to those in the audience to ask questions or to provide your insights and comments on all of these issues as well. So with that, I'll open the floor. Start with Michael. Thank you, Cynthia. It's always nice to be introduced by a former Fletcher School colleague and <laughs> classmate. Uh, my name is Michael Zwerin. I'm with Adesso, based in Nairobi, Kenya. I had a question that was building on something Tom said about how sometimes the unanticipated benefits of a resilience program can spur peace building opportunities. And I want to give a concrete example on a USAID funded work in northern Kenya where Adesso is implementing a large resilience and economic growth in arid lands project with USAID support. Mm -hmm. We had a project in northern Kenya where there had been recurrent tribal conflicts over grazing resources among pastoralist societies, and we were doing large-scale resilience programming, and the conflict resolution component emerged as one of the unanticipated benefits because while working with one Samburu community, we also were working with a neighboring Burana community, and we discovered an opportunity to do joint grazing land agreements that reduced and hopefully will eliminate long-term recurrent conflict and uh, livestock raiding amongst the different communities while focusing on the climate resilience and the uh, long-term ability for the communities to develop um, diversification of livelihood sources in the face of increasing drought and increasing um, insecurities about climate. So I just wanted to bring that as a concrete example of um, a USAID supported resilience goal that ended up with a peacemaking result, unanticipated as it may have been. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. And, and uh, if I might add, in some of these, you can also, uh, you can have a number of unintended, or maybe you actually did intend them, but uh, they're, you know, secondary uh, goals. And that is, for instance, in these um, ones I mentioned in Lebanon, we did similar 
projects in, in West Bank and Gaza, and then and later on in Iraq. And that is, in each case, we set up a, a committee, a council, whatever, within the village or the group of villages. And we said that it had to include women. It had to include youth and, and sort of not just the traditional politicians or big businessmen or whatever. <coughs> and we found it started to give them a voice. I know in some villages in southern West Bank, when we did this approach, we went in a year later and we found now that women were much more engaged in the local community and speaking up in local council meetings and stuff than they had ever been before, even though the, the, technically it was a water project. But it was done in such a way that you, you build the community. Mm -hmm. And that also helps, again, I think, in, in, uh, in terms of conflict mitigation. Thank you. Uh, there's a question back here. and. Up front. I'm Johanna Mendelson Foreman at the Stimson Center at American University. Thank you all for your interesting contributions. But there's a word I didn't hear today, and that's governance and how institutions create resilience. And I was curious to see, it, since it's now out of vogue, it seems, uh, to talk about the relationship of institutions to the ability to be resilient, because usually it's the absence of institutions or weakness of them that creates some of the conflicts in the first place. And I was curious to see how you reconciled those concepts. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Why don't we take one more question, and then mm -hmm. we can let the panel respond. <coughs> uh, good afternoon. My name is Rosemary Seguero. I'm the president of Hope for Tomorrow. We focus on conflicts and violence prevention. I'm um, based here in Washington, DC, and I come from Kenya. Uh, my question is, uh, looking and listening to what you are talking, how do you involve uh, the civil society and how do you work with them, especially looking at Sandra? Thank you so much for saying, including people and what they want. I focus on the rural areas. Rural areas are left 75%, 80% people live in the rural areas who need what we are talking. So how do we collaborate with you as an organization based here in uh, Washington, D.C., and I'm working in Western Kenya? He was talking about northern Kenya. So <laughs> how do we collaborate with you looking at serving the actual people and they need what they need? And uh, looking at women, when there is violence, conflict, women and children are the most victims who get affected. How do you come in and help them? And how can we make this happen by assisting through growth, development, or humanitarian? Mm -hmm. So uh, I want to know about from the USID, from Rockefeller, and you all, because the news is just here. But out there, people and working with people like us is uh, not easy to get through the USID or Rockefeller or <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let's start with these two questions. The first on governance and the role of institutions, and second on engaging civil society. If I might jump in, actually, I th to me, these two questions are actually very closely related, because good governance involves, inv you know, it means involving the local community, local groups, civil society, women, and, and, and so on. And, and that is a critical aspect of developing resilience, of doing good development, uh, and, and, and especially conflict mitigation. The role of the local community is, is critical. Um, and, and certainly that's an important part of when we, for instance, again in Ethiopia, when we redid our country strategy and built resilience into the entire program, we made governance a cross-cutting issue. Okay, in every single program, so that the health program, the education program, the agriculture program had to develop good governance, okay, and we specifically did put that as a cross-cutting issue. But the way we framed it is that, to me, good governance is being responsive to the local community, okay? And so in, in, in order to do a good project, if it's a healthcare project, you have to involve the local community, it's local civil society. Same with education and so on. And then you build the institutions from that way up. Now you also probably have to do some training of local institutions, in, but in a way that um, integrates the local community into that institution. 
So for instance, again, in Ethiopia, let's say we, when we were working with the Ministry of Health to develop their health centers, one of the best ways we found to improve the service, the quality of service of that health center was to incorporate a, commu a committee that included members from the local community to sit on the governance board of that institution. And that amazingly uh, had, had a huge impact on improving the, the quality of service and even allowing them to charge for services they never charged for before because people said, no, if, we, if I get a good service, I'm willing to pay for that. But again, it was by involving the local community, you build the local institutions. Joanna, she always asks the toughest questions as, as long as I've known her. Um, and I, for one, uh, given my work on democracy and governance issues at AID, certainly have had that foremost in my mind as we've been thinking about it at the Rockefeller Foundation. And just in <coughs> our own learning around um, the resilience work, uh, be it you know the work we did in climate change in Asia or even prior to that, the work that we've done in terms of uh, 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 supporting agricultural development, particularly in Africa, you know, climate smart rural development work, is um, governance or the lack thereof is such a huge hindrance for resilience, um, resilience building, and we see it all the time. And that annulus, in my view, there isn't just one place around it that is the governance place. This is, you know, that's the corner for the governance. It's the entire thing. And for me, it's not, and for us, I should say at the foundation, it's not a one-way street. It's not what city administrators or national governments or local governments can do. Um, it's that interaction uh, between uh, decision makers uh, at various levels, because um, there are decision makers in communities as well. That is that interaction that really makes for a more improved, um, uh, I guess, um, uh, enabling environment for, for the kinds of um, processes and activities and investments that actually make for um, a better or more resilient community. And so it's interesting that we don't use, it's interesting that we don't use those, uh, that term in our conversations about this, but it's very, very present um, in, in everything that we're doing there. And I, I, I also just wanted to say uh, the foundation has, um, we don't do work without civil society. So let me just start there. And I think that's the case for most of us on this, on this um, panel and, uh, and the way that we work is to really understand um, you got civil society comes to the foundation with their ideas and we say oh I think that's fairly fantastic but here's you know a little bit of support where you might be able to go about doing that and how can we work together learn together um, I do think that there uh, what the other thing I don't hear as much about is what kinds of capacity is being supported, particularly uh, in institutions in the global south. And Michael and I um, from Adesso have had these conversations as well. And this is one where I think we won't crack this resilience challenge until we start to um, have better partnerships and relationships with global south institutions to um, to really focus on what's working in there in, in the communities that they know best and how we might be able to kind of surface, amplify some of those innovations. And that's certainly what we hope to do through the Global Resilience Partnership. But um, there are two questions that I'm very pleased that you asked about because I think it's largely, it's the big elephant in the room and we um, have <coughs> to address it head on to be able to, to make some headway. Shall we take a few more questions? Let's take here in the back and up front. Um, thanks. I'm Jennifer Bremer of uh, Arizona State. And um, looking at, particularly at the Horn of Africa, it seems to me, although I wouldn't claim to be an expert in the area, but having read about it quite a bit um, and worked in other parts of Africa, that, 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 um, that there are significant changes going on in what have been, prior to that point, very long-standing traditional systems that had developed some means of coping. But now, because of the drought, the population, people moving to urban areas and losing some of the ties, um, you know, greater presence of arms, of course, Islamism, you know, any number of things that, uh, that one could mention, that these traditional coping mechanisms have really broken down. And the question is then, how do you, you know, work through that um, when you're really looking at, at at introducing wholly, not, perhaps not wholly, but dramatically different ways of, of being able to work together um, into a situation that 
is, is under very, very severe stress at the same time. Thank you. Uh, let's take the question in the back. Thank you. I'm Nathan with the uh, DC Office for the Church of the Brethren. I have a question uh, relating to contexts that are already in, say, more high level uh, states of conflict. So we work with the uh, Church, uh, Church of the Brethren in Northeast Nigeria, and the place is heavily affected by Boko Haram. So thinking in terms of resettlement or trauma resiliency there, how do we, what are your thoughts on <coughs> entering into or working more in, extensively with organizations in levels of high intensity conflict or relatively high intensity conflict and incorporating uh, principles or ideas of resilience into that, that sort of work. Thank you. And let's take the question up front before we ask the panelists to respond. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> I'm uh, Fred Kringold from Virginia Tech. And uh, first of all, I'd like to just say how pleased I am to hear about the attitude toward innovation, the connections between humanitarian and development activities and connections between resilience activities globally and domestically. And uh, I've been involved to some extent in the Rockefeller activities related to the Department of Housing and Urban Development on resilience. And I've seen there a <coughs> tremendous benefit of the partnership. That is that the foundation's participation has opened up avenues of discussion and consideration and participation that might not otherwise have happened in the sort of standard agency approach to, to issues. So I really uh, think that the collaboration of NGOs, think tanks, foundations, and government agencies is a uh, uh, a wonderful and um, uh, promising uh, development. Uh, we work particularly on building regulatory issues, which sounds pretty, pretty top-down and dull, but I, I think it's, it may be a good example of how important your circular diagram was. And that is that in order to have any meaningful impact in the place quadrant, mm -hmm. or in the infrastructure building quadrant, we found that it's absolutely necessary, first, to depend on the knowledge quadrant to address the issues of the human health and well-being quadrant and to work within the reality of the economic and institutional quadrant so that, in a way, even though we're in the area that you think or mentioned may get too much attention. <laughs> it's absolutely dependent on our understanding and active interaction with those other three areas mm -hmm. that you mentioned. Thank you. Okay, so first question, traditional resilience capacities that may be strained or changing, and uh, guidance about working in areas of high intensity active conflict, and if anyone wants to comment on innovation and alliances. I, <laughs> I, I, I can take the North, Northeast Nigeria one, <laughs> possibly. That's uh, a tough one, yeah, really. <laughs> yeah, we're, I mean, we're grappling with the same question. Um, so th as a starting point, you know, is it relevant to take a resilient approach in situations like that? Uh, I described Syria as one where we don't think it's that viable. We did some analysis in Lebanon. It's not active conflict as such, but it's um, in a state that it would be difficult to, to, to think about resilience in ways we do in um, some of the other places where we've invested. That said, I mean, there's, there's two entry points that we're looking at. Um, one, based on our work in North Central, so a little bit less intense um, area there on, I think it's some CMN-supported work, looking at linkages between economic development and conflict and trying to make the case that um, you know, in fact, it's costly for businesses um, when there's conflict, it just drops trade routes. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's roadblocks and things that, that drive their costs up. So trying to get the business community essentially to, um, to step in and say, you know, this is really not worth supporting here because implicitly um, they're typically players one way or another. Um, the second route um, that we've thought about it but have done less investing and in, in looking through is um, more of actually some of the governance related grievances there. So if we're saying that um, um, 
you know, autonomy and representation and de delivery of services, um, our, our governance grievances that people in the Northeast hold, um, then, you know, working on those as, as potentially contributing to stability, um, which is maybe a prerequisite for some more resilience related kind of interventions. Um, uh, maybe I'll try a couple of the ones about the, the co traditional coping systems. Um, it is true that there's a breakdown of those, especially when you get huge climate shocks or certainly conflict. Um, and I think that's part of what we're, we're grappling with. And in a way, how do we help them use their systems more effectively, trying to find out what it is that, that you know, is is making them not able to use them. So for instance, in southern Ethiopia with the, the, the pastoralists, as John was mentioning, one of the traditional coping mechanisms is for people to move their cattle further distances. Well, then, first of all, now you have more cattle and more people, so that makes it more difficult. Uh, so one thing is to develop, as, as John uh, was mentioning, that you develop the relationships ahead of time so that you can, you can, you know, negotiate the movement of the cattle. And then also, if you can get the numbers down through the system I was talking about earlier with what we called commercial destocking at the beginning of a drought, that helps to mitigate that. Um, in, in areas where um, people are not so much pastoralists, but the highlands of Ethiopia, the traditional coping mechanism for the poorest people was to go and get labor. To, to work on somebody else's farm, basically, when their, um, uh, you know, when their, when their land uh, wasn't uh, producing. Um, and again, partly with uh, l um, numbers of people, so small farms are smaller and you got more people, so it's, it's more difficult then for those people to move and get, uh, you know, labor jobs. So one of the things we're trying to do is if you provide some sort of employment education, whether it's uh, regular education so that they can get a better job, um, uh, different types of, of, uh, of um, vocational training so that they can go to town maybe and supplement their income. So try to work with their traditional coping mechanism, which is to go and find a job somewhere else. Uh, but but it's an issue and and even traditional coping mechanisms for dealing with conflict We're finding in South Sudan the traditional method of course was the tribal elders Play that role and religious leaders. Okay, but now when you have huge amounts of displacement Okay, people have to flee to areas uh, that are away from their traditional area they're often away from their elders there they get they get to have a gun the young men and they start uh, you know joining militias and so on they're much less susceptible or uh, persuaded by their traditional elders and so that coping mechanism for conflict is a problem that we i think we haven't completely solved yet and then if i can uh, I, I liked your question about the regulatory issues those are very critical, and I think sometimes we, we forget about that. Again, going back to the example of Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, of course, there's no private land ownership. Okay? And that's a, a mantra of the government they're very proud of. Okay? That, that's the way they protect the little guy. You don't have the big capitalists coming in and buying everybody's land. Okay? But, of course, there are some drawbacks to no private land ownership, as we know. Um, so through long and slow, uh, careful process of negotiation with the government, we help them to understand that it might be a good idea to at least do land certification. Because the system is that the government rents land to everybody and they have a register at the government land office that says that you have this plot of land and you have that plot of land. But first of all, you're not 100% sure. They control it and it, it's very, uh, you know, uh, it could easily be taken and moved to somebody else. And often the, the actual boundaries of the land are not well marked and well known. And so first of all, you have conflict over the land. And of course, from a development perspective, 
you have no incentive to improve your land, to put any investment into land, because it might be taken away from you next year or in the next couple of years. So through a land certification program, we helped them, we piloted it in, in several different parts of the country, where they went in and did a proper survey of the land, okay, and then produced a certificate, a piece of paper, that said, okay, this is my land, this is the pro boundaries, it's a 25-year lease, or a 10-year lease or whatever, so I know exactly how long I have it, and it has the husband and wife's name on it, okay? We found two things. One, the, the, the conflict over the land dropped dramatically because now everybody knew exactly the boundaries of the land. Secondly, from a development perspective, we found that the yield per acre on those plots of land went up between 11 and 40% with no other input other than a piece of paper that says that I have some guarantee that this is my land, okay? And I remember going out to visit some of these plots and, and talking to the people, and the women all wanted to come and talk to me. And I said, okay, great, tell you now, tell me this is great. And I said, well, why is it so good for you as opposed to, I said, ah, because the woman's name is on it. It used to be in the past that if her husband died, then the brother, the cousin, the other men would come and take the land. Now, she's got it, okay? And best of all, well, best of all, but one of the, the, the other good aspects is you could sublease it for short periods of time, but at least you could sublease the land. So if a woman, her husband dies, she's got six kids. She can't farm that land by herself, but she can sublease it. She maintains not really title, but at least something. She gets a little income. Then we give her a little training on uh, some, you know, income producing. She can move to town. She still gets a little bit of income from the land, and she can start a little business selling chickens. Okay, it's had a huge impact for the women. Just that little piece of paper. Mm. So now we're in the process of spreading that land certification across the country. Mm -hmm. Back to the regulatory. Okay. Excellent example. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> um, Sunday, Roger, Mark, any last thoughts or responses to these questions? Um, maybe just last thoughts, if I may. Um, I, I think I, again, want to thank um, the Wilson Center and USAID for inviting us to enter in the conversation and discourse around resilience and conflict, um, particularly given that we have the partnership with USAID and the Global Resilience uh, on global resilience in the Sahel, the Horn, and South and Southeast Asia, it'll be another way for us to think about conflict as a stressor um, in those contexts and, and how we might want to, what we need to do differently, how we need to learn um, about new things. And so I, I really appreciate it because resilience is not only a practice, and we've been talking a good deal about the kinds of actions and behaviors that one needs to do to be able to build the kinds of um, uh, adaptive capacities that are required, but it is a mindset. It is a mindset that I, I think um, uh, many of us ha have to think through just in terms of the, the systems thinking and the interdependencies and you know um, the other things that, that are engaged in this. So that's one thing I'd just like to say. Um, another I'd just like to say is um, the universality of the challenges that we're talking about, I think for me is just, um, really important and we often talk about things in certain regions um, the data rich the data poor the you know the Sahel versus the you know South and Southeast Asia but no matter where we are I mean we've seen these challenges in New Orleans we've seen many of these challenges in uh, New York City we see them all around the world um, the universality of this triple threat of globalization and urbanization and climate change faces all of us. And so it might be at different levels, but um, you know, my own personal experience uh, in Superstorm Sandy and just the mm. whole information deficit as you were talking about, I mean, really trying to get back to how, how is it, what do I need? What are those things that we all need to, to really um, make a turn in terms of um, becoming more <laughs> resilient in, in, in the face of many of these uh, events or stresses, um, I think it's, is applicable for all of us around the world. And the last thing I will just say is our, the conflicts of today or yesterday will not be 
hopefully, on the ones of tomorrow, but we'll have a new set. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of it is just um, for us to, again, focus on what it is that we can do to, um, to weather the very inevitable, but perhaps uncertain uh, circumstances in, in the coming years. So I'll leave it with that. Great. So I, I thank you, Cynthia. I have just, just three quick thoughts. I, I think as we move forward, it would be very interesting for us to continue to, to think about different actors and the role that they play in this space. And in particular, I'm thinking about the private sector. What's the role of the private sector in building trust and thinking about what this means for um, peace building in a climate changing world? I think that that's an area that we could be doing uh, some more work on, building on what you were saying about your work with the reinsurance industry and others. The second point that, that I wanted to throw out there, I know that Rockefeller Foundation has a model within your 100 Resilient Cities where you're developing chief resiliency officers right. in an urban setting. And I think as you roll that out and you test that in an approach, I would, would challenge us to think about whether there's anything about that model where we could be developing chief resiliency peace builders um, is there something that we can spin off from that what are we learning mm -hmm. from what you are doing that can be transferred into this space I think that's a very interesting um, question for us to, to think about and finally I just wanted to say a word about about gender uh, building on some of the points that you raise when you look at the literature around environmental security and, and peace building the the feminist literature very often criticizes this field for focusing on the state or, or ecology and not enough on the individual, particularly women and how they are differentially um, influenced and impacted. And, and some of the research by researchers like Valerie Hudson and others have used proxies for looking at ways that states treat individuals, for example, in the violation of women's rights, and what this means about a state's propensity for conflict. And I think these are some very interesting models that we can re further refine in a context of climate change, recognizing the differential impacts on women and the poor because of climate change, and what this means for how we determine specific interventions in terms of policy and programs. So I think that's a very interesting body of research that, that is emerging um, and, and provides um, some opportunities as we move forward. Thank you. John and Tom, do you have any last reflections? Thanks again, Cynthia. It's really nice to see USAID out in front on thinking about the conflict within the resilience agenda. Uh, one thing that comes to mind that I think we should be paying attention to on this issue is um, you know, a related stream of resilience and conflict language we see coming out of the, the countering violent extremism uh, push, which um, you know, is also, I, I think, extremely relevant. Um, we're certainly interested in working on resiliencies to supporting or engaging in um, violence and extremism uh, generally. Uh, but, but I see us needing to continue to keep the, the focus of, of resilience on not just not engaging in the act of conflict, but on a sort of a, a higher level state that's mm -hmm. really speaks to more of the resilience definition that we have in USAID and Rockefeller and, and elsewhere, which is, you know, able to, ability to, to deal with a conflict or other shock um, in a way that doesn't undermine your sort of long term prospects. So just don't want, it, want this agenda to get completely subsumed by that, but just to see where there's complementaries, but, but also where they diverge. Great, yeah, and thanks for inviting me. It's really been uh, a pleasure. And and as someone who's you know been involved in development now for more years than I want to admit, um, it's great to see this you know uh, focus on resilience and linking uh, you know a more a more multidisciplinary, integrated approach to the issues uh, that we've all been grappling with for all these years, and uh, and and also I think. Maybe we haven't thought enough about the aspects of conflict and peace with resilience. And so that's great to see. And then just, you know, looking at this panel here, are you a, a government official, an NGO, a think tank, a foundation, civil society folks in the audience? I mean, that's, that's what it's all about is, is that um, not only multidisciplinary, but multi-institutional 
what the proper term is, approach to this is, is so critical. So uh, thank you very much for letting me be a part of this today. Thanks. Thank you all. Um, regrettably, we have come to the end of our time plus. So mm -hmm. since everyone wasn't flooding out the doors, I am assuming that they are as engaged in the conversation as we are up here. Tom, those closing remarks couldn't um, have sent, um, expressed my sentiments better. I think, as Melissa said in the very beginning, the purpose of RFPP2 is to encourage cross-fertilization of thinking across different communities of practice. And uh, the role of Roger, Mark, and myself in, in this project is um, to help RFPP2 bring really complex issues like this into a forum where we can have complicated conversations. Our job is not to always simplify, but really to problematize and then to allow our spell ourselves the space to think through these issues together with different partners and to open our ourselves to different ways of thinking about these challenges. So we hope that today's conversation was as engaging for everyone in the audience as it was for us. It was the first under RFPP2, and we hope that you will join us for many more of these conversations over the next four years. And we really appreciate all of the panelists being a part of this today and all of you for joining us. And I'd ask you all to join me in thanking the panelists for their remarks today.